Hold on. Okay, the recording is on. So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. We're going to pray together and then we're going to get started. May I invite somebody to please unmute your mic and pray with the class, and then we'll start. Anyone can please pray. Go ahead, Elisha, go ahead. Can I pray? Okay. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are most grateful. We thank you for this opportunity to, Father, sit at your feet and to hear your words. Father, we pray and commit ourselves into your hands once more. Lord, mm -hmm. continue to guide us, guide our thoughts, guide our understanding, and guide our interactions. Father, we commit Pastor Ashes to your hands, O oh God, continue to increase his wisdom that he will be able to communicate to us in the best language that we all can benefit from these lessons. We thank you for an answered prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. And everybody, welcome once again to our course on the end times we um last week we um started the main part of the course which is um to get a panoramic view of this and the sequence of events and we're kind of getting going to get into all the details of the sequence of events so we started that we could be spending many uh many weeks i guess many hours in this chapter uh so that we could you know we could answer all the answer questions we could ask questions discuss try to understand um you know why uh, things are going to happen and how we i mean why things are going to happen the way we say they're going to happen or in the sequence they're going to it's going to happen and we will ask questions we can discuss and uh, do our best so let's uh yeah this is where we got started this is chapter four um giving us a panoramic view so we know the scriptures in many places and i've just referenced to here uh, but there are many scriptures that tell us jesus is coming back and then we tried to have this little chart uh maybe i'll make it a little smaller okay um to give us a uh, kind of an overview of uh, the sequence of events. So we are right now, I'll just quickly review and then uh, say a few things and we go forward. So we're right now in the church age. So if you imagine the beginning of this line here, um, as the time in um, the Lord Jesus, uh, after his resurrection ascended to heaven and the day of Pentecost. So from that time, you know, we are in the church age. Uh, God is working in the church. He's also working uh, with the Jewish people. He hasn't abandoned them, but the New Testament is focusing on the church. So we then talk about the rapture of the church, seven years of tribulation, the second coming of Christ, uh, and then the thousand years, or which we refer to as a millennium, and then uh, the end of the age which is the uh, the great white throne judgment and then new heavens and the new earth now i just want to uh, kind of relate uh, some of the uh, terminology we used uh, you know in the beginning when we talked about people who have uh, uh, different positions you know uh, different uh, views so it's very on this chart it's easy to point that out so very e easily uh, people who say they are pre-tribulation that means they believe that the lord jesus is coming or the rapture of the church sorry we talk about the pre-trib mid-trib and post-trib the pre-trib people believe that the rapture of the church will take place here before the tribulation the mid-trib 
people believe that the rapture of the church would take place in the middle of the tribulation. The post-trib people believe the rapture of the church or if it will end here after the tribulation. So there are different positions. Uh, you know, as we go through scripture, we will see you know why some people may take these positions. You know, uh, just to mention quickly, uh, I will give us strong reasons as to why we believe in the pre-tribulation position, why we believe the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation, which is what we have shown in this chart. Some people believe the rapture of the church will take place in the middle of the tribulation, mainly because of what we read in Revelation uh, chapter uh, chapter 14. Uh, yeah, Revelation 14, uh, the, the, you know, the 144,000 Jews are taken away up into heaven uh, and they are the first fruits uh, because of that. That's one reason why some people have that position and some have the position at the end of the tribulation. Now, uh, the other terminologies are that we used in the beginning, uh, and just to compare it to this chart, we said that our position is dispensational premillennialism. So that's our position. That means we believe in the rapture of the church before the millennium. So millennium is starting here, but we believe in the rapture of the church before the millennium and before the tribulation. So dispensational premillennialism. Now the, the dispensational refers to the ages. So we strongly believe that we are in the church age and the church will be taken out of the way, the, uh, the end of the church age, the church will be taken out of the way before the tribulation and the millennium you know, before the tribulation starts. So that is dispensational premillennialism. Now you don't have to remember all these terms. I'm just uh, explaining those terms in the light of this chart. So, you know, you can understand that. And then after that, you can forget all the terms, uh, focus on the scriptures, okay? Uh, but I'm just explaining those terms. So dispensational premillennialism. Now, the other, another term we, also saw was historical premillennialism. They believe the rapture of the church will take place here. Uh, there's still premillennialism, that is before the thousand years, but they believe the church will go through the tribulation and be taken out here. So that is historical premillennialism, or what we would refer to as post-tribulation, right? And the, his, uh, the dispensational pre-millennialism, we would refer to as pre-tribulation, right? Then we also saw another term, which is, uh, and then there was amillennialism, and then there was also a post, I think it was post-millennialism, post, post So what do the post-millennials -millennial, believe? Post-millennialism believes that Jesus Christ will come here at this point, at the end of what we say is a thousand years, and he will take the church directly into, so everything wraps up here. So basically, Jesus comes up, comes here, and, uh, and so that the, the church is actually journeying all the way through right here, and everything that is said, uh, you know, in the book of uh, Revelation is happening, you know, or is going to happen all the way through here. The church is going through and through the church, the kingdom of God will be established. This thousand years uh, of reign of Christ will happen through the church in a spiritual sense, not Christ literally reigning on the church, on the earth. And so the church goes through. So the church is a centerpiece. Everything's happening through the church. Jesus is reigning for a thousand years through the church. And then he comes here and he wraps everything up. So this is post-millennialism. So that means they believe it. Christ comes after the millennial. The a-millennialist, that's the fourth term, uh, 
they also believe Christ comes here at the end of the millennium, but they believe something different. They believe that everything started here. That means it started here when, uh, uh, when Christ was raised from the dead, right? Uh, the last days began and uh, he will, you know, everything will happen. And they don't literally, they don't believe in the, you know, whatever we were reading in Revelation, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's going to happen, you know, uh, not literally the way it's said. And it'll all, you know, so the church will just journey through all of this. Um, things in Revelation, yeah, they will happen. So basically Acts 1, Acts chapter, or the Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church, all the way to Revelation 20 happens here and Jesus returns. So very similar to uh, post-millennialism, except that they don't believe in the literal fulfillment of Revelation, you know, uh, till Revelation 20. It's just sort of things that uh, a lot of it is just typology and so on. They don't, basically they don't believe in that happening literally. So that's why it's called a millennialism or uh, literally they, they don't actually believe in those things happening church came jesus comes back and wraps everything up so these are the four major you know positions the terms that we mentioned uh, don't be too worried about those things um, uh, you know uh, my, my my recommendation is just you know understand from the scriptures the sequence of, of these events and the scriptures that back these things up okay uh, so we are not going to be, uh, you know, necessarily pulling on those terms again. I just wanted to explain it, uh, it with reference to this chart. So it might be a little clearer uh, what those terms mean. So let's get started now. So we're going to get start looking at these things and answering some of the questions that, uh, you know, that come to mind. So first of all, the rapture of the church is uh, clearly, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, so the word rapture, let me just say this. The word rapture, of course, is it's the, it doesn't appear in the English Bible or doesn't appear in Greek, but it comes from the Latin word. Right? So from First Thessalonians chapter 4, in Latin, uh, the Latin Bible, and we will read First Thessalonians 4, uh, there is uh, the word simul rapimor. Simul simultaneously, rapimor together. So the word rapture in Latin simply means together. So it is in the Bible, but it comes from Latin, right? So some people say, well, the rapture is not word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it's it's the root is Latin, and in the Latin Bible it is there. It's just you know it's just the word that means together. Uh, so we are caught. We are going to meet the Lord together. Rapture means from the latin it simply means together or to be caught up together right um, so that's what it means rapture means together so we are going to meet the lord together in the air we all together meet him in the air so it comes from latin so if somebody says it's not in the bible you can say yeah it is it's in the latin bible and many of our not not many but there are english words that have a latin root this is one of those words uh, that come from there. Okay. Now, the description of what happens there in, rap in the rapture is uh, found uh, uh, in these two uh, passages. So let's read them and look at them a little carefully. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know many of us would have read it, and I, um, I usually read both these passages in every funeral uh, that I conduct and. You know, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing that uh, when we are uh, you know when we are uh, mourning um, the loss of a person, meaning the death of a person, the passing away or the home going of a person, uh, it's it's encouraging for us to remind ourselves that death itself is not the end. So uh, and so you know many of us may have read these passages before, but let's read it again. Could somebody read First Thessalonians four? 13 to 18, I just want us to focus in on certain aspects here. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. 
But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to point us to uh, a few things here. So in verse 16, Paul is saying, this we say to you by the word of the Lord. In other words, you know, Paul is saying, look, this is the word of the Lord. You know, I'm not making this up. You know, I'm not coming up with some nice story. Uh, this is the word of the Lord, right? So he says, brethren, we're telling you this by the word of the Lord, meaning we are, we are um, transferring to you the very words of the Lord, okay? So uh, what do we believe? He says in verse 13, concerning those who have fallen asleep, right? So here he's comparing death to sleep, right? Now that does not mean that death is sleep. You know, now that's something we should avoid. Uh, some people, you know, literally say death is sleeping. Uh, that means, uh, the person dies, the body's there, and the spirit and soul is inside the body, and they're sleeping in the grave. Uh, you know, some people interpret it like that, and that is wrong, right? Why? Because just read on the next verse. It says, it says, those have fallen asleep, and this sleep theory of death is incorrect, because the very next verse says, if we'll, we believe that, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Well, where are those who sleep in Jesus? Where are they? They are with God. That's verse 14. Because God will bring with him. Right? That means the sleep theory is not correct. You know, that you put, you put the body there and the spirit and soul is sleeping in the body, resting there in the ground uh, or in the lower part of the earth. That's not true. No. Why? Because verse 14 says, God will bring with him. That means those who have slept in Jesus, that means they have died in Christ. Where are they? They go to be with God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's another side note. He says, God will bring with him. And then he's talking about the coming of the Lord. Verse, verse 15, the coming of the Lord. So here again, God the coming of the Lord. So the Lord is God. Okay, here's another, that's a side note. So now what's going to happen? Verse 15, he says, we say to you by the word of the Lord that we are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So he's talking about the coming of the Lord. So the Lord is coming and there are people who have died in Christ. What will happen? Verse 16, the Lord will descend with a shout with the voice of an archangel. So there's going to be this announcement in heaven. There's going to be some sound in heaven when the Lord himself descends. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be the voice of an archangel. And there's going to be the trumpet of God. So when the Lord descends, what's going to happen? There's going to be a shout. An archangel is going to shout. And it's going to be the sound of the trumpet. And, you know, later on, I just explained that trumpet is very significant because uh, in the Old Testament, the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet was used to, for two primary things in the context of God's people. One, it was the sound of the trumpet was used to assemble the people together, collect them together. Second, the sound of the trumpet was used to announce the presence of God. Uh, we will look at it now. 
So it's very significant. The sound of the trumpet is again being used here. Or uh, when the Lord, verse 16, when the Lord descends, right? So he's going to descend just the way he ascended. He's going to descend from heaven. That time an archangel is going to, you know, make a bigger shout or make a big announcement and blow the trumpet. And then it says at that moment, the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who have died in Christ, they are coming with him, that's verse 14, their spiritual person is going to be receiving, it's going to be wrapped up with their resurrected bodies, that is the dead in Christ will rise. Then verse 17, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. So in an instant, we who are alive, and if you and I are alive and when this happens, in an instant, our bodies are going to be changed directly from what they are right now, flesh and blood, mortal bodies, flesh and blood, corruptible mortal bodies. Suddenly, they will be changed into spirit bodies, flesh and bone, incorruptible, immortal, just like the body of Jesus. So in an instant, and we will look at the scripture from 1 Corinthians 15 and Philippians 3, they describe it, but in an instant, this flesh and blood body becomes a flesh and bone body. Uh, the flesh is not human flesh. It is incorruptible, immortal. I'm using the word flesh in a very, uh, you know, just as a, a terminology, but it's, it's, it's spirit material, okay? So this flesh that we have right now is a flesh and blood. It's mortal, corruptible, but it becomes a body of a different material, uh, like the body of Jesus, flesh and bone, but it's immortal, incorruptible. Because, you know, after Jesus was raised from the dead, he said, you know, you touch me and see me. Uh, look, uh, he, he had a spirit body, but that body passed through walls. That body just, you know, didn't have to walk. It just moved, you know, so uh, it's a different kind of a body. Uh, and it's an immortal, incorruptible body. So we who are alive, our bodies are instantly changed, and then we will ascend to meet the Lord in the air. So you can imagine this is a coming together of every righteous soul. That means those who have died, all the saints who have already died, they're coming with the Lord. They come and somewhere in between, you know, from the earth, it doesn't mean everybody's bodies are in the earth. You know, some have died at sea, some have, you know, uh, bodies may have been destroyed. Uh, obviously, obviously, all bodies have been destroyed completely. But as they're descending, God is giving them this glorified bodies. Then we also are just are immediately changed and we're all caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And it says we will be forever with the Lord. Now, it doesn't say at that point, is the Lord going to come down or is he going to go back up? But the idea is we're going to be with the Lord. The Lord is descending. We are all meeting him in the air. So you can try to imagine this. Pe you know, people from all around the world, the globe, believers, we're all going to meet him in the air at some point. I don't know exactly where. And we're all, the bodies, we're all going to be, and there's going to be this great heavenly, Gathering. So if you can imagine millions and millions and millions, I don't know, maybe billions of people up in the air, between heaven, between the heavens and the earth, around the Lord. And he says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what we are saying is at that moment, and rapture comes, the Lord comes, 
we meet him here in the middle and he takes us into heaven. Now you say, how can we show that? It doesn't state that exactly here in this passage, for Thessalonians 4, it doesn't state it. How can you say, because it doesn't state, we meet the Lord in the air and then where do we go? Do we come down to the earth or do we go up into heaven? It doesn't state it. It just says, so shall we be with the Lord, ever with the Lord. So we are saying he's going to take us into heaven from there when we meet him in the middle. The question is, how can we say that? Which we will answer. Okay, But let's get a little bit more detail on this event itself, the rapture. Right? The coming together and the meeting together in the air, uh, this changing of the bodies and meeting the Lord in the air. Let me look at that event itself. And then we will answer the question, why do we say he's going to meet us in the air and take us back into heaven and not meet us in the air and bring us to the earth? Right? We will explain that. But let's look at the rapture event. Itself. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 58, please. Somebody could read that. And then we go to Philippians 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 58, please. Pastor, can I read? Yes, please. I'm reading from the Amplified Version here. Okay. It says here in verse 51, take notice. I will tell you a mystery. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall all be changed, transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay. And we shall be changed, transformed. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature and this mortal part of us, this nature that is capable of dying, must put on immortality, freedom from death. And when this perishable puts on the imperishable and this that was capable of dying puts on freedom from death, then shall be fulfilled the scripture that says, death is swallowed up, utterly vanquished forever in and unto victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now sin is the sting of death, and sin exercises its power upon the soul through the abuse of the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile. It is never wasted or to no purpose. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 All right. So thank you. Thank you, Bula. So notice he says, um, verse 51. We shall all be changed. He says, verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So this is going to happen, you know, we use the word instantaneously. In an instant, we will be changed. Right? Uh, what part of us will be changed? He's saying, he's explaining here, uh, the uh, I, I'll come back to a few things, but in verse 52, he says, the dead will be raised incorruptible. So it's like a parallel passage to 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead will be raised, and we who are alive, we will also be changed. And what will happen? Verse 53, corruptible will put on incorruption, mortal will put on immortality. So in, a, in an instant, this outer man is going to be transformed. And all what we can say is it will be like the resurrected body of Christ. 
how do we say that? Because uh, First John three says we will see him as he is. When we when he comes, we will be like him. So that's what happens. Our bodies and First Philippians three also we will, we will read. These bodies will become like that resurrected body. Right? Verse fifty four. Corruptible put on incorruption, mortal will put on immortality. It's like we are bypassing death. Bodies are changed in an instant. And that's when verse 54, 55, it's like death. This is it. You have no more victory. Now, yes, at this point in time, people die, even believers die. And we put their body in the grave. So it seems like, you know, nobody can escape death. But at this time, 1 Corinthians 15, death, death's power is vanquished. The dead in Christ are going to be raised and with glorified bodies. And those who are alive will receive glorified bodies directly. And you know, we, we'll, be, we'll be laughing at death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades or hell or grave, where is your victory? Right? So that's that moment is a great moment. It's like the last enemy is gone. Right? Now, here again, verse 52, he's talking about the trumpet. The last trumpet. The trumpet will sound. Now remember in First Thessalonians 4, he also used the trumpet. Now, this is again a point where sometimes people uh, connect it into the book of Revelation. So in, in the book of Revelation, we see that during the seven year tribulation, there are three sets of uh, seven judgments. So there are the uh, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls during the tribulation. So because in 1 Corinthians 15, we read the last trumpet, or some people say, well, uh, the, this, this rapture will take place on the seventh trumpet during the tribulation, because it says last trumpet. But then our response to that is, well, you know, the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls in the seven-year tribulation are all judgments on the world. It has nothing to do with the church. So we should not connect the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15 with the last trumpet of the seven trumpets seven trumpet judgments. That is our response, you know. Whereas those who want to position the rapture on the seventh trumpet, we say, look, the, during the tribulation, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls are judgments being poured out on the earth. They're not a blessing or anything, you know, that kind of a thing happening. Uh, it's on the world, world and therefore, we shouldn't necessarily just just because it's seven trumpets, uh, you know, we shouldn't connect this to that. So then they they will ask, you know, what do you mean by the last trumpet in First Corinthians fifteen fifty two? Well, uh, the way we can understand it is, it's the last trumpet, meaning it's the final. Two ways we explain it, and I've put it in the notes. I'm just talking to you now, but it's in the notes that I've given you. Um, the way we explain it is well. It's the final announcement for the church age. So that's why it's the last trumpet. It's the last trumpet because we understand in scripture, trumpet is used for two things, the gathering of people and the announcement of the coming of the presence of God. So that's why we saw when you put First Thessalonians 4 and First Corinthians 15 side by side, we see that when the Lord descends, there is the shout of the archangel and the sound of a trumpet announcing the coming of the Lord. Then there is this trumpet saying, people come, gather together. So two trumpet sounds. One announcing the Lord's coming, another announcing the coming together, the gathering of the Lord. 
right? And both these are, are seen in the Old Testament. Um, uh, where is that? Yeah, yeah. So in uh, the trumpet of God, right? So uh, Numbers 10 talks about the trumpet being used to gather people. Exodus 19, 16 talks about trumpet ushering in the presence of God. So that's how, you know, we uh, will explain uh, why we believe the, um, the last trumpet is not the seventh judgment trumpet, but it is the gathering together, the announcement of the presence of the Lord and the, the gathering together of the saints of the Lord. Okay. Um, the other passage that we want to read is Philippians 3, 20 and 21. I will, I will give some time for questions. Uh, we will cover some ground and we will definitely take up some questions. Okay. Um, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Somebody can read that for us, please. Shall I read, Pastor? Please go ahead. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Hmm. Thank you. So notice he says here, we are waiting for the Lord Jesus. But verse 21 is very clear. He will change our lowly body. This death doomed mortal corruptible body that it may be conformed to his glorious body so what kind of a body are you and i going to have what is this glorified body that we are going to receive he says yeah it'll be like his glorious body okay so that's why we say, you know, uh, some things that we can say about the uh, body we are going to receive at this rapture, it's going to be like the body of Jesus. So what can we say? You know, it's a body that passed through walls, but it still could be touched and felt. Jesus told his disciples, you know, you touch me. See, I've got a body, but it's different. It's different material. It passes through walls, it ascends, it descends, it, uh, you know, it's different. It, it functions in different ways. It's a glorified body, a resurrected body. He could even handle food. Uh, he could ascend into heaven, so on. So the same body Jesus has, we have. Now, I want you to think about this, and uh, I don't want to, you know, uh, go off too much on a tangent, but I want you to think that the eternal word has this glorified body. Which he did not have, or at least to our knowledge, we don't see. But he probably, and I should use the word probably, he probably didn't have it before his incarnation. Right? Because the eternal word came into the earth, became a man, resurrected, he had this glorified body. And he ascended with this glorified body. Something to think about, we don't know everything about it. But the Bible says, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So that glorified body contains the fullness of the Godhead because he's, he's God, he's part of the Godhead. Contains the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So while this mortal body cannot, could not and cannot contain God bodily, this glorified body contains the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just something to think about and we will get to know more about it when we get to heaven, okay? So the coming of the Lord is like a thief in the night, meaning when is this rapture going to happen? Yeah. So let's go to First Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, let's read that 11 verses. Uh, and I think after this, I will pause. First Thessalonians chapter 5. 
Somebody could read verse 1 to 11, please, for us. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. So this is right after Paul has written about the, the rapture, right? He continues writing this. Go ahead, please. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. 1 to 11. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain our salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Mm. Thank you, Christopher. Now, remember this passage, First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, which we just read, is actually a continuation of what he wrote in chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, it's a continuation. So chapter 4, he has said, we are going to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, he didn't tell us, we meet him in the air, are we coming to the earth, are we going to heaven? But we're going to be with the Lord. And then he shifts and says, okay, brethren, concerning the times and seasons, I mean, when this thing is going to happen, you don't need to tell me, you, know, you don't need me, me to tell you, because this is going to happen the day of the Lord, that the, so this the, this event happening is referred to as the day of the Lord. Now, as we mentioned in the very beginning in the introduction, the day of the Lord is a term that's used, you know, in many different contexts. So, uh, depending on the context, you need to understand it. And so, in this context, the day of the Lord means this day when this rapture is going to happen. The day of the Lord. Peter will use it differently. Uh, he, he'll use it to talk about the day of the Lord in terms of the you know new heavens and the new earth. Um, Others will use it, the day of the Lord in, in other ways, right? In the, even in the Old Testament. So, but here the context is this happening, the rapture happening, the day of the Lord, this happening is like how a thief comes in the night, meaning the thief comes unannounced, the thief comes unexpected in the night. In other words, he's saying, just be ready for it. Just be ready for it. We don't know when it's going to happen. And so he gives us, you know, uh, a lot of instructions. Let us live as people of the light and not live as people of darkness. Because uh, just like, you know, and he uses other pictures, like a, a woman going into labor, which is, you know, uh, she can, she knows, yeah, it's, it's close to the time, but she doesn't know when it will going to happen. And then the time comes. So it's like that. So that's, again, another example. And she says, so let's live as people of the light. And then in this context, look at verse 9 and 10. He says, this is going to happen because God did not appoint us to wrath, but to have salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and next verse, it's it's one verse. Verses nine and ten is one sentence. To obtain salvation, Lord Jesus Christ died for us. That whether we are alive or dead, we should live together with Him. So you look at verses nine and ten. Put it in context. What you say? This coming of the Lord, we don't know when. It's like a thief in the night. So we must live as children of the light. But this is going to happen so that we can experience salvation through Jesus Christ. And we don't need, God did not appoint us to wrath. What is that wrath? The wrath that's going to be poured out on the earth. So God didn't appoint us to that. And therefore, this is going to happen. The rapture is going to happen. Because God didn't appoint us to wrath. But instead, whether we are alive or dead, we are going to be raptured so that we can live together with him. So previously he said, we're going to be with the Lord. Now he says, we're going to escape the wrath and we're going to live together with him. It, it doesn't conclusively state, he doesn't you know, categorically state we're going to escape tribulation, but he says we're going to escape wrath because this is happening. The rapture is happening. We're going to escape the wrath and we're going to live together with him. So this is an indicator to us. And we will give you give other clear you know, reasons, but right here you find Paul is telling us this rapture is taking place so that we can escape the wrath and we can live together with him. And that's one indication. Okay, he's going to meet us in the air and do what? Bring us to the earth so we can go through the wrath? Or are we going to be taken out so we can live together with him? But from all indication of verse 9 and 10, put it in, putting it in context, we are going to escape the wrath and live together with the Lord. Okay, so, so, that, so that means this rapture taking place, we are going to escape the wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath, seven years of tribulation, judgment of God being poured out on the earth. God has not appointed us to wrath, but for us to live together with him. So we're being taken up into heaven. That's just one indication. I'll give you solid many more reasons on why we say this is going to happen. All right. So what are we going to do there in heaven for seven years when there are seven years of tribulation? Right. Um, during that time, we know when we are seven years, when we are in heaven, all these things will happen. We will be with him in glory. We will see him as he is. We will be like him, living in glorified bodies. It's a, we also read Ephesians, you know, Philippians 3.21 and 1 John 3.2. Uh, we will know God as we are known. 1 Corinthians 3.12. He'll be welcomed into our mansions in heaven. We'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive rewards for our work. We will look at these passages. Uh, we will engage in worship as redeemed kings and priests. Uh, we will be joined in worship through martyrs who come through the tribulation. That means there are people who die during the tribulation, believers, uh, who people who become believers and are killed. They will join us in heaven and we'll be worshiping the Lord and they'll be part of the marriage of the Lamb. So during the seven years, we know all these things will happen. Okay, let me pause here and... Um, I know I didn't leave any time for questions in this uh, lecture. Let me see other questions. All right, are there any questions here? Okay, so there's a question from Dibia. Is there a difference between the resurrected body of Jesus Christ and, uh, and after he had ascended to heaven, which kind of the believers receive at the rapture? And will we receive a different body as Jesus did? Yeah, so to answer that question, 
expand there. We have, we will, you know, we can only look at, you know, Philippians 3.21 and also 1 John 3.2, where it says, when he comes, you know, we will be like him, 1 John 3.2. When he is revealed, we shall be like him, 1 John 3.2. So Philippians 3.21, 1 John 3.2, both tell us we will be, uh, you know, we will have a, a body like his glorious body, uh, we will be like him. So this, this resurrected glorified body, Jesus ascended with that body. And that's the body he has, that's the body in which he's moving. So as he appeared to his disciples, you know, he appeared to them in that glorified body. And uh, uh, it's just a different material. We don't know what it is, but we can see what Jesus did in that body. And these scriptures are telling us we will, our glorified bodies will be like that glorified, glorious body that Jesus had. Um, that's uh, as much as, you know, we know at this time. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just had a follow up on that. Uh, so if it, it was the same body, why was Jesus telling Mary Magdalene not to cling to me? For I have not yet ascended to my father. Um, uh, so why mm. is that mentioned? Yeah. So on the day of the resurrection, when he appeared to Mary, and Mary recognized him and said, Rabboni, and he said, don't touch me yet. I haven't ascended to the father yet. So what happened? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 says, he ascended to the father so that he could offer his blood in the most holy place in heaven. So then he came back and uh, after that, when he met his disciples again, then he told them, hey, touch me. Uh, he told John, you know, not John, uh, what is Thomas, Thomas, touch my, touch me, you know, look at, you know, I have a real body, right? So what, ha what was the difference? What happened between the resurrection day and a few days later when he, oh, it could have been maybe, you know, I don't know exactly how many days, but a few days when he came into that room and he, or, or even when he walked on the road to Emmaus uh, with the disciples and he sat at the table, you know, what was the difference? The difference was Hebrews 10. Uh, and let me give you the exact words here. Yeah. Um, Hebrews 10. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, that he um, he entered into heaven uh, with his own blood. Um, uh, Hebrews 10, 12, after he offered, one second verse since I write down, mm -hmm. it must be in Hebrews 9, yeah. So Hebrews chapter nine, verse 12. Hebrews nine, verse 12. What did he do? He entered the most holy place with his own blood. So that's what happened. He had he had not yet done that. He had not yet gone into the most holy place with his own blood. Now, you know, I know some people who ask the question, you know, how, well, how did Jesus ca carry his blood? You know, uh, because he died three days back uh, on the cross. Who collected his blood? Where was it kept? How did he carry his own blood into heaven? See, all those things we don't need to know. Uh, and it may not even be necessary. Uh, it just means that he entered into the most holy place, according to Hebrews 9, 12, where he said he is that sacrifice that was already offered to, for the people. But that was the difference. The only thing different between the day of resurrection when he told Mary, don't touch me, and a few days later when he told uh, Thomas, touch me. Okay, okay, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. All right, I know we have a lot of questions, a lot of hands get up. Um, uh, you know, we will go ahead and take a break. And as soon as we come back from the break, uh, we will answer, we will take up all these questions. Uh, please keep your hands raised throughout the break time. I'm just joking. Um, we'll take up your questions right after we come back from the break. Is that okay? Uh, 10 minutes break, and then we'll get into the questions and move forward. Okay, thanks.